Friends, you may remember that we are working through this series, making the invisible visible, looking at art and discipleship, and uh, we've been navigating it for a few weeks here in the summer. We began uh, by hanging out with Van Gogh, and we took a look at Starry Night, and we reflected on how the church has at times been impacted by consumerism, and how that it almost runs contrary to what Jesus invites us into. Then the, the week after that, we looked at the church at Overs and we kind of discussed how our past experiences of church shape our perception of things. Then we looked at Van Gogh's bedroom, right? And we saw how there's a dynamic of self-expression that carries a complexity because there's how you present yourself and then there's how others receive that presentation of self, and they don't always align. And then we ended our time with Van Gogh by lo looking at the potato eaters, and we thought about how Vincent sought to illustrate the essence of peasants as they actually were. And then similarly, we discussed how Jesus' invitation is to love others as they actually are, and not as we want them to be. And then last week, we chatted about the subversive street artist Banksy, reflecting on how the whole story of Jesus was one of subversion. And then additionally, we touched on how the invitation to follow Jesus is an ongoing invitation to live an alternative kind of life, one that mimics the subversive way of Jesus in the world. We noted how everyone wants to change the world, and yet few are willing to risk what it will take. And then along the way, we've mentioned how art can function as a bit of an apocalypse, it can bring shape, form, and color to memories, ideas, and feelings. Things that are real, yet aren't tangible. It can be an unveiling of what has been hidden. A literal making uh, the invisible visible. And this is the way of things when discussing concepts of discipleship and following Jesus. Individuals come together together. And as the church, we participate in the body of Christ. We have the opportunity to serve as an embodiment of the way of Jesus in the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. And friends, we are actually invited to live in such a way that the abstract concepts of God, of love, that they become tangible. That grace becomes visible that an aroma of peace begins to be picked up as a watching world moves past us. And they experience the unveiling, the hidden becoming seen, the invisible being made visible. Now, this morning I woke up. I wiped the sleep out of my eyes, and I stumbled over to the shower, turned on the water, got in, and uh, I got dressed, I went down and I made coffee, then I proceeded to drive here. It was a peaceful drive. Sun was shining, had the air conditioning on, so I didn't even feel the burden of the heat. But you know what? Not once, not once that I think about the fact that there's a war going on right now, wreaking devastation and hell on earth, taking place on the other side of the earth. Right? Russia continues to bombard Ukraine. And yet, friends, here we are sipping coffee, and enjoying the company of great friends. Right? It's just the reality. I've never experienced war, but I can imagine it's one of the most disruptive forces on earth. When we think of all of the wars that have taken place and continue to take place, I don't think it's a stretch to say that our, uh, we live on blood-soaked ground. Now imagine the collective headspace of the Western world as they emerged out of the First World War, right? All of the promise of the scientific revolution, all of the ingenuity and progress of the industrial revolution, and yet even still, so many sons lost to the horrors of war. And as people tried to wrap their heads around uh, what they had just gone through, I think there would have been a cognitive dissonance, right? People had been so hopeful, had been so pleased about progress. 
and then they move through hell on earth. Now, coming out of World War I, a group of people ignited a cultural movement that came to be called surrealism. Surrealism. Now, this movement saw artists depict unnerving, illogical scenes, developing techniques to allow the unconscious mind to express itself. In many respects, I think it emerges right out of that cognitive dissonance they would have felt coming through the World War. And it was in this movement that Salvador Dali moved to Paris to participate in the surrealist creative explosion. Now, this painting, The Persistence of Memory, is perhaps one of the best-known paintings from this movement. It is one of the two most popular pa paintings at the Museum of Modern Art. There's this one, and the other one is Van Gogh's Starry Night. So it's in good company. Now, think of this painting as a visual brain teaser. There's a lot going on. Now, one description of the painting describes that the painting depicts a dream world in which common objects are deformed and displayed in a bizarre and irrational way. Watches, solid and hard objects, appear to be inexplicably limp and melting in the desolate landscape. Dali paints his fantastical vision in a meticulous and realistic manner. He effortlessly integrates the real and the imaginary in order to systematize confusion and thus to help discredit completely the world of reality. We see that in this painting. Watches melting on themselves. Weird images. A barren landscape. You can see the water is still. Even though it's just a painting, there's almost a, an oppressive heat emerging from the desert landscape, the hills emerging in the background. Now, now, friends, we live in a world where strength and stability are presented even when one doesn't feel so strong or stable. I got to say, I've asked Dan how he's doing recently. He's never told me about any heart issues. You bury that. I'm doing fine. Right? I'm doing okay. We often ignore the pain and the emptiness that lies just under the surface. Now, life is complicated, and it seems to be growing more complicated year by year. There are times where I long for the simple joys of childhood, right? Where I could go down and join Calvin, Wes, and Parker, and Kelly, and I think the other two, as they throw a ball around or play tag. And the biggest issue is whether someone's following the rules or not. Right? The simple joys of youth. But we're upstairs, because we've all gotten a little older. Children inevitably grow up. And as one grows up, it doesn't take long for the complexities and burdens of life to move in and crowd out the simplicity of youth. I note this when I compare Kalen and Parker, right? Kalen is quicker to uh, see some of the problems in life, and the, she feels a little deeper. Even this morning, I gave her the option, are you going to come to church or not? And she was worked up because she's like, what if I, what if I regret the, my decision? What if I make the wrong decision? Right? Just a couple of years, and there's, and again, you have personalities there as well. But as you get older, you start to feel the complexity of life begin to weigh heavy. The reality is no one is spared. There's a wondrous mystery and a confusing sadness in life's complexity. Now, offering a reflection on what makes good art good, author Ronald Rollhauser maintains that good art is good precisely because it takes life's complexity seriously and shines a light on it in a way that doesn't resolve the tension too easily. Poor art, invariably sentimental, precisely because it does not take life's complexity seriously, either by refusing to acknowledge it or by resolving it too easily. And then he goes on to say, in a way, good spirituality is similar. It takes stock of the complexity of the human heart. 
Good, sp- good spirituality is similar to good art in that it takes stock of the complexities of the human heart. Now, reflecting on this dynamic pushed me to consider how often this idea is expressed oh so clearly in the, in the Bible. Scriptures are filled with stories of people finding God and helping to bring God's kingdom here to earth, even while their lives are full of mess, right? Confusion, frustration, betrayal, infidelity, sin. No one is immune to the spiritual, psychological, sexual, and relational complexities that trouble us all. No one is immune from it. Now, I got to say that evangelicals have historically been good at whitewashing the situation, right? There's an appearance of black and white, and all too often being on the white side. Pristine, having it all together, having all the answers, all the gray areas eliminated. Even in the midst of uncertainty, though, I believe this complex reality is a good thing. I actually don't think we're doing anyone any favors when we ignore the complexity of life. I think that complexity actually pushes us to be humble. Humble. And when we reflect on it, we know that we don't have it all together. When we're honest, we know that we don't measure up. Our level of understanding and our level of arrival is constantly shown to be lacking. Right? You can't get through a day without recognizing our own foil, foibles and failures. We know we have work to do. We know we aren't perfect. We know we fail, and we know our understanding is limited. Now, being aware of and accepting this inherent complexity makes it possible for us to embrace empathy and forgiveness. Empathy and forgiveness. Life is hard for everybody. Everyone is hurting. We actually don't need to blame anybody. We're all troubled with the same issues. When we understand and accept the truth of this complexity, it can help us forgive each other and then forgive ourselves. Friends, prominent in this painting are the soft, seemingly melting watches, the clocks. Now, in a world where time stops for no one, Dali calls the stability of time into question. When asked about the limp watches, the artist compared their softness to overripe cheese, saying that they show the camembert of time. Time flies. Well, time got away from me. It's time. Time waits for no man. There never seems to be enough time to get done what we need to get done. If you notice there on the clock that's slumping over that hard tabletop edge, there's actually a fly depicted on that glass, illustrating that time truly does fly. Dali compared these melting clocks to camembert, as I said. Now, overripe camembert contains an unpleasant and excessive amount of ammonia. Now, imagine, it'd truly be disappointing when you're expecting a a delectable piece of camembert, and as you bite into it, you're expecting one thing, and yet you get something completely other. That's how it is so often when we navigate our time. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he wrote, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. That's Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16. Each day contains 24 hours, each hour contains 60 minutes, and each minute contains 60 seconds. Each of us is afforded the same allotment of time each day. Laverne, you don't get more than me, just so you know. Jonas, same with you, buddy. We all have the same amount of time. Now, a verse like this can be made to challenge listeners. Carpe diem! Seize the day! Get out there! Make the most of it! Work harder, faster, strive more! You aren't doing enough in these evil days, so go out and make the most of them. Now, friends, I actually think that uh, 
Paul's intention is the exact opposite of that tone. He goes on to encourage his listeners to be filled with the Spirit, to encourage one another, to point each other to Christ, to sing and make music, to be filled with gratitude, thanking God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I get the impression that making the most out of every opportunity is less about hustling hard and more about reveling in the good gifts that God has given to us. It can see counterintuitive, yet experience proves the point. Some of my favorite memories are when I linger with friends way too late, creating memories and enjoying the God's gifts even when I feel it the next morning and I'm a little overtired. I can think back and say, yeah, but that was worth it. That was good. We enjoy and we encourage and we challenge, and we point people back to God, and we filled with gratitude, and we sing and make music. No one lies on their deathbed and wishes they worked longer hours or worked harder. It just hasn't happened. The regrets they inevit- inevitably have are about the people they wish they had spent more time with. And friends, when we allow the Holy Spirit to guide those interactions, beautiful things can take place. Beautiful memories, beautiful moments. Be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because these days are evil. Now, notice the watch in the bottom corner. It may be difficult to see, but it's swarming with ants. For Dali, ants symbolize decomposition and death. Apparently, the first image that struck him as a child was when he observed Ants swarming over the decaying remains of a bat. And that just stuck with them. Ants equate to decay and death. Now, interestingly, while I was preparing for this morning, I was working away and I felt a gentle tickle of an insect crawling up my leg. I looked down and there was an ant making its way down my leg. The striking reminder that we're all going to die. Even I am going to die. It was like a little moment there. I bet there was a chuckle. Death will come for each one of us. And while we hope it's a long way away, we live with the reality that it could be tomorrow. It really could. It's a somber somber thought, I know. But friends, rather than this triggering images of darkness, grief, fear... We're invited to live out our days well and then to die well. All with the confidence that comes from knowing that we belong to the victorious king, the risen king, the one who defeated death when he died on the cross and rose from the grave. As we lean into experiences of the risen Christ, we come to say with Paul to live as Christ and to die as gain. Friends, the heart of the gospel declares that in Jesus, the kingdom of God has drawn near to earth, that through his life, death, resurrection, and enthronement, sin and death do not have the final word. So while Dali may have rightly understood that death and decay will come for all of us, we hold on to a firm assurance that death is not the end. Paul, writing in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 and following, says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Love it. Now you need to look carefully at the painting. Notice that strange, fleshy creature kind of in the middle with a clock draped over the top of it. You may think I'm crazy, but if you look carefully, you can actually recognize a human figure there. It is said that this strange creature is actually a self-portrait of Dali. If you look in the top, uh, kind of that, that, that left uh, side of it, you can see the eyelashes coming down, kind of long, elongated eyelashes, and then a bit of a nose and a kind of a tongue hanging out. So 
I'm just saying, that's not me that says, that says this, but this, this is, it's a self-portrait. Now, perhaps it's a comment that no matter how hard one tries, even the painter himself cannot control time, cannot control shape, entering into a dream world where uh, reality and the illogical swirl and mix Time cannot be controlled. Safe ideas of objectivity can sometimes feel like they're being erased. And the concept of control is challenged regularly. Now, as part of his reflections on truth uh, and authentic, on true and authentic love in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul reminds his readers in verse 12 that for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Friends, no matter how hard we try to control time, control situations, control our contexts, we simply can't. We simply can't. We can't control it. It's not ours to manage. We see through a glass darkly. But friends, even if we can't see, understand, or control we're invited to trust the God who can. He sees and knows. He understands. And we're told that he's working all things together for the good of those who love, love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. We're told this. We're encouraged to embrace it. There's a reason that following Jesus and navigating our day to day after Christ is called faith. It's called faith. It's not called control. It's not called certainty. It's called faith. The author of Hebrews says that faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. We can trust the one who sees and knows. We can trust the one who is working all things out for the good of those who, love, who trust the Lord. Friends, we don't need to see the end. We simply need to keep our eyes on the one who knows the end. In a world of war, Famine, disease, death, bills, mortgage payments, expensive gas and groceries, and random trips to the hospital to check on our heart. The complexity of life is real. And I want to encourage you not to fake it. We don't need to understand it. We just get to live it. But the choice is, will we trust Jesus? Will we give it to him? Come what may. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you that you are at work in the world. We thank you that even though from our human perspectives, things are often irrational. We don't get it. Our friends and loved ones have confused us the last couple years. And yet we trust in you. I pray that you would continue to soften our hearts, that we would continue to learn to seek Christ first, to have our eyes firmly fixed on him, so even though all the world may seem chaotic, we stand firm on the one who is the solid rock. Lord Jesus, bring us through. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.